So thank you for coming. Uh, this talk is uh, Covert Debugging, Circumventing Software Armoring Techniques. Um, my name is Danny Quist, uh, co-founder of Offensive Computing, a uh, PhD student at New Mexico Tech. I do reverse, engineer, uh, reverse engineering, exploit development, and a uh, member of CDC NSF. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm Val Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of Offensive Computing. Uh, I do malware analysis, reverse engineering. I'm also a contributor on the Metasploit project, uh, do pen testing, and part of CDC NSF. So uh, just real briefly about, so those of you who don't know what offensive computing is, uh, we're a small company that does uh, malware analysis. We provide free access to a, a large database of malware samples, about 160,000. I believe we have the largest open malware collection on the, uh, on the web, at least it's published openly. Um, we provide a, a few business services like custom malware analysis, uh, malware data mining, uh, you know, targeted information for malware and reverse engineering. Okay, so th this talk is about debugging is about debugging malware and specifically tracing its runtime. Um, we want to monitor API calls and we, we want to get to this area where we can do dynamic analysis across a wide range of them um, because that, that provides us with automation for automatic analysis. But the, the point is, is that malware is getting really good at preventing it. A lot of the packers are pretty clever about doing things. They, do, they detect whether you're debugging them. Uh, it's trivial to detect VMs of all types and variety. Um, and these were, these were techniques that were originally pioneered by legitimate software trying to keep crackers out. So what we're going to talk about is the general techniques of software armoring, uh, go over some of the requirements. And we'll talk about two methods. The first one is dynamic instrumentation, and the second one is going to be a page fault assisted uh, debugging method. And as an application, we'll show our uh, generic auto unpacker and the results of that. And so Val's going to talk about software armory. Okay, so uh, this is just sort of some background information on uh, different techniques that software uses to protect itself from analysis. So I'm going to run through a variety of techniques some uh, manual demos before we get into our, uh, our new stuff. So uh, there are several ways that, that software uses to protect itself from analysis. Uh, some of the most common are packing and encryption, uh, SEH tricks, virtual machine detection, debugger detection, and uh, something called shifting decode frame. And I'll go in depth into each one. So packing encryption is uh, generally where you, you take another program feed it an executable, and uh, it will compress it or encode the uh, instructions in the binary. There'll be a small decoder stub at the front of the binary, which uh, contains the instructions for how to decompress or, or unprotect it. It'll do things like restore the import table, which we'll get into more later. Um, also, it can play tricks with, with these portable executables, the file format that Windows uses, uh, like hiding the imports table, uh, securing relocations, encrypting, compressing the executable. So this is kind of what a normal PE file would look like if you're looking at the sections. You can see up there on the screen some um, you know, clear text, understandable assembly instructions, uh, some calls to different uh, functions. And this is what a packed or protected uh, executable will look like. Pretty much gibberish. You can't understand what that is up there. And then there's a, there'll be a little bit of instructions that tell the program how to decrypt itself. The next technique that uh, binaries use to, to protect themselves from analysis is something called virtual machine detection. And we talked about this at length last year at DEF CON. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing this. Uh, one of the, the best ways is a single instruction detection using things like the, uh, the descriptor tables. Uh, there's a bunch of tools out for this. Uh, Joanna Rakowska made something called Redpo, which is pretty great. Another tool called Scoopy-Doo. And last year, we, uh, we released a tool called OCVM Detect. Um, and, and this basically relies on the fact uh, that uh, there's instructions for privileged and unprivileged CPU mode. Virtual machines try to be efficient, but not necessarily secure from the point of view of, of hiding or being stealthy. Um, if, you, if you want to learn more about that, go to Joanna's talk. Um, they don't fully uh, emulate x86 uh, instruction set or architecture bug for bug. So the next set of protections is uh, called debugger detection. 
And generally, when you're analyzing a malicious file to see what it's doing, you'll put it in a debugger and, and step through it and try to see what API calls are made, what's going on. So what a lot of malware authors have done is try to detect that and then take some action to prevent you from doing it, whether it's destroy the binary, uh, cause the debugger to crash, or whatever. There's a variety of things it does. The most common technique that we've seen is something called is debugger present, and this is a native API called the Windows that you can use. It checks the uh, process execution block for the magic bit. You can hide from this really easily. There's all the debug plugins that let you hide from this. Um, so there's a lot of ways around this, but malware authors still use it quite a bit. Another good way to detect if you're being debugged is a timing attack. One way of doing this is issuing the uh, RDTSC instruction so that you can check, okay, well, am I running really, really slow? In general, that means I'm being debugged. Uh, this is pretty effective. It definitely uh, makes it harder to analyze the malware. So another thing that, uh, another part of debugger detection is things like uh, int3 instruction scanning. This is where you see am I being breakpointed or paused. Uh, malware will also check some its own executable to see if it's been modified. Um, hardware de debugging detection, looking at CPU flags to see certain signatures that indicate that we're being debugged. Uh, a lot of people used to use a tool called Soft Ice for doing uh, binary analysis. And it's a pretty good tool. It's been discontinued. Um, and there's a lot of ways to detect Soft Ice. There's a ton out there on the internet. Same things, checksumming, int3 scanning. There's a, a bounds checker signature that works pretty good for soft ice. So another thing that uh, malware does to protect itself from analysis is, is called SEH tricks. This is basically where uh, the malware will use the structured exception handler uh, in order to unpack itself. And the way this works is the structured exception handler uh, receives an error from a program, passes it to a handler which takes some action, whether it's pop up a window on the screen, or in this case, it's the instructions for unpacking or, or deobfuscating the, the binary instructions. So malware will use this actually to unpack itself. The problem with this is that in many cases, the debugger will, will think, oh, well, it, it crashed, so there's nothing else for me to do, or the debugger itself will crash. There's ways around this. Also, there are plugins for Ollie debug, uh, different settings you can use. One thing we saw recently is, is a T-lock will actually do divides by zero to cause an exception and pass itself to the, the decode uh, instructions. Uh, okay, so one of the other uh, techniques is shifting decode frames. This is where a uh, binary will be encrypted or obfuscated. It'll take little sections of itself, decrypt them, run the instructions, re-encrypt them, move to the next section. The, this is pretty hard to defeat. Um, there are ways to do it. It's kind of specific depending on the packer. And uh, some people have actually implemented these techniques for legitimate uses, like patch guard. The Mita is another good example of a packer that uses this. So, but basically the, the Achilles heel of these protection techniques is that it has to execute. It actually has to run on the hardware. There have to be valid instructions. So at some point you can observe these instructions and tell what's going on. So if it executes, it can be unpacked. So now I'm going to go into sort of the manual techniques. It's, it's a pretty labor-intensive process to deobfuscate uh, software. And I'll give a simple example so you can see how this works. So the way an, an unpacker works is that um, there's a write to an area of memory. This is where it begins the decode. The memory is read from. It begins to execute. And then there's more memory to, that, that is written. This is optional re-encoding. The main concept here is that the CPU can only execute valid instructions. It can't execute compressed gibberish or, or encrypted information. So this process can be monitored. Unpacking is basically a function of timing. If you can get to the point where the instruction is being passed clear text to the processor, you can read it, you can unpack it. So there's several stages to the manual unpacking process. Uh, the first thing that you generally do is try to identify what is it packed with. Uh, most malware uses a subset of common packers that are available. There are a few that use custom packers. These are often, you pretty much can't identify it. You just have to manually figure out what's happening. The next stage is to find what's called the, the OEP or the original entry point. This is the point at which the original software executes uh, after it's been deobfuscated. Once, in general, with most packers, once you're at the original entry point, uh, you have the process in an unpacked state. If you can dump it, uh, you dump the process memory to a file, 
You can read it and analyze it and see the instructions, function calls, etc. The next stage is generally when you dump to a file from memory, you have to fix it up to make it look like a valid uh, PE file so that you can analyze it with IDA Pro or, or some other tool. So there's several methods for identifying the, uh, the type of hacker that's being used on a binary. Uh, but probably the most common is, is a tool out there called PID, which, which is pretty good. It's signature-based, so it's got thousands and thousands of hacker signatures. Uh, the second tool, which is one that we use often, is MSFP scan. This is part of the Metasploit framework. Uh, it's been modified to actually do hacker signature detection and uses a similar database to the PID database. The nice thing about that is that you can automate it and script it versus PID as a GUI tool. Uh, also, there's a really great tool from Arrow Carrera called PE File. Uh, which Danny here has made some contributions to, and we've tested it against a large set of malware to, to make sure it works very well. Um, sometimes you can manually look at section names or other parts of the binary and get hints. They'll leave hints in there as to what the packer is. And there's a ton of other scanners which are usually not as good as the above methods, but sometimes will yield interesting results. So this is just a screenshot of various uh, tools uh, detecting what packer type's being used. You can see a sort of little gray box in the middle. That's PID detecting a UPEX packer. In the background is our website uh, detecting a packer as well. And the black window is uh, Metasploit's MSFP scan. OK, so once you've identified what packer type is being used, uh, there are a whole bunch of methods for finding the original entry point. This is probably, in general, the hardest part of the process, depending on the packer. Uh, one good way is if there's a ton of Ollie scripts at these websites, OpenRC is a great resource for this. Um, the problem with these is you, you have to have an analyst running Ollie debug, bringing it up, loading the script, and, and basically doing all this. So it takes some time. Um, there's also a bunch of tools out there which do OEP finding. They're signature based, they're specific to certain versions of packers, and uh, they're a little hard to use. Here's an example of a. a a script being run in Nolly Debug to detect the OEP of a UPEX pack binary. So the highlighted uh, instruction up there in Nolly Debug is actually OEP in this case. Okay, so once you've uh, located OEP, uh, the next step is to dump the process memory to a file. There's a whole bunch of tools for this. Uh, Ollie Dump is a good plugin. Lord PE is one I like a lot. And uh, there's a bunch of custom tools. But basically, these four API calls are, are what does this process. You open up the process, read its memory, create a file, write it to a file. It's pretty simple. So this is a screenshot of Lord PE dumping a file, dumping a process memory to file. OK, so one of the most important things uh, to look at to understand what a malicious file, or, or any file for that matter, can do, what its capabilities are, is the import table. This is basically a list of functions that are imported from DLLs in the system. Uh, most malware will try to obfuscate this, obviously, because this is how you know what can it do. Can it make calls to the internet? Can it create files, delete files, edit registry? Um, there are a couple of tools for fixing the import address table when it's been obfuscated by malware. The best is probably import rec, but again, it's a GUI tool. It's a manual process, hard to automate. Uh, this screenshot shows the two tools that I know of, import rec and a tool called reversion actually rebuilding an import table. OK, so at this stage, once you've dumped it to a file, uh, you should be able to see clean disassembly, instructions that make sense. The IET should be visible. You should be able to analyze the file and figure out what it does. Uh, this process can be pretty tedious. And if the packer is a difficult one, it can take hours for the analyst to figure out. And if you have 160,000 pieces of malware that are packed, there's pretty much no way you can manually unencrypt them all. But once you get it uh, fully deobfuscated, this is basically what it looked like in IDA Pro. You can see the imports, you can see strings, you can see internal functions to the binary. So I'm going to show a quick demo of the manual process. OK, so we're going to take an actual piece of malware here called Netball and detect what it's been packed with. It's been packed with UPEX in this case. So I'm going to execute it here to prove, yes, it's actually a valid running process. It opens up a, a TCP port. You can see the Windows firewall detected it. 
So the next step is I'm going to dump this into Ida and see what I see, see what it looks like. Uh, what can we tell about this before we try to unpack it? I'm just going to analyze it, load it up, and basically what you're going to see is it's been obfuscated. The name's window is pretty much empty. There are no internal functions available to us to look at. Uh, the imports table is pretty limited. It's very rare that an, a binary actually has that few imports. So pretty much we can't tell very much about this binary. We need to deobfuscate it. So the easiest way to do that, UPEX is pretty simple. We're going to load it up in Ollie debug. And Ollie debug detects that something's not quite right. We're going to load a uh, script, which is an OAP finder. This helps us do it rapidly. Once it runs, you can see the, uh, the top instruction there at address uh, 40BB08, I think it was, is the actual original entry point. So uh, basically, we've paused execution at the entry point. We're going to dump this process from memory to a file so that we can try to analyze it. Lord PE's dumped it for us. We're going to make sure everything is uh, OK with the binary. Now we're going to rebuild the import table so that we can see what functions it imports and what DLLs. So this is import rec. We're getting the import table here. It's analyzing. So right there, it's figuring out, okay, it's importing like socket and send, things like that. Now we're going to fix the dump that we generated from Lord PE. And we're going to pop it open in IDA, and you'll see a, a, a totally different view of this binary than what we saw before when we tried to analyze the, the pack binary. So Ida's going to analyze this. And you can see already there's more information than there was before. This is the imports table, much more. You know, Previously it had about 10 things. Now it's totally populated. You can see this thing modifies registry, does all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's a names window. You see here's a bunch of internal functions to the binary. And we should be able to see some valid instructions that make sense. So that's the manual process on an easy to do packed binary. And it took a little while. So it can get quite tedious. Okay. So all of this should say is that, that you know Val's really good at unpacking this stuff and manually debugging it, but as you said before, it takes a lot of time. We want to find a extremely generic way to debug, and if we can modify this to do everything automatically, then I can fire Val and save a lot of money. Um, and so the solution should be pretty generic. Um, I want it to work across a whole bunch of executables. Uh, it should be efficient, so we get good performance. Um, undetectable as much as possible. I don't want to say 100% undetectable. Um, and extensible, so that you can uh, actually script things inside of it. So again, the, the algorithm is track the written memory. Um, if that memory is executed, uh, it's unpacked. And that tends to be a pretty good heuristic for, for doing this. So you have to be able to monitor memory writes and memory executions. And uh, we want to automate the process. So the first technique we looked at was dynamic instrumentation. Um, this, this allows a running process to be monitored, and you can set API uh, hook points. Uh, the one that we used was Intel's PIN library. Uh, what PIN does is it uses a just-in-time compiler to insert code before and after uh, an instruction. Um, and what's nice about this is it retains the consistency of the executable. So if the executable goes to look at its own memory, it's going to find what it's expecting there. So you get good control of execution, instructions, and memory accesses, and you can attach at the basic block. Uh, and what's nice about PIN is that it allows you to attach and detach from the process. So normal instructions prior to uh, PIN looking at it uh, is just like this. This is normal assembly. And PIN inserts instructions before and afterwards. And that's where you can uh, put your API hooks. And you can get, you can actually set a trigger points so that you can do it on reads and writes of memory and actually on instruction execution. Uh, so afterwards, it looks like this. You have your uh, instructions interspersed with PIN instructions. Um, so the two pin hooks we used were memory write and execute. We track the writes in a simple hash table. Uh, and if execution occurs on the written data, dump it. Uh, and the results were uh, pretty successful. For the most commonly used packers, uh, it works fairly well. 
Um, these are mostly the packers that don't actually try to self-verify themselves, or they self-verify but do it poorly. Uh, and this is roughly 70% of all of our malware in our collection. Um, and uh, for our collection of malware, which is fairly representative, we think, uh, these are the packers that we saw used uh, mostly. Uh, UPX and P compact are the top two. Uh, Armadillo, uh, we'll ignore that one for now. FSG, uh, ASPAC, and ASProtect, uh, you know, round out the next one of them. So this works on all of those except for Armadillo. Um, and just, just as a test or a proof of concept of this, we created a Hello World application, and then we graphed the results inside of a, a GDE, or the Go Visual Diagram Editor, which is a really good uh, uh, graphing package. Uh, so for the Hello World example, uh, this is taking execution at each basic block uh, and creating a little block with a memory address in it. And the idea here is, can we find the uh, unpacking stub? Is it something that we can visualize pretty quickly? And the answer is that yes, a unpacking stub is usually a tightly coupled, uh, close together set of instructions uh, that should stand out. And if you look in the lower right, right hand corner, there's a lot of connections between each of those basic blocks that are being executed. Uh, and so looking at this, you can see the addresses and find that the unpacking loop is easy to find. And it makes pretty pictures. It's good for wowing advisors. Um, uh, so the generic algorithm works well. It validated the idea. Um, we uh, verified all the addresses by uh, manually unpacking it. And um, uh, display clustering, that's, that's also nice. And attach and detach is effective. Uh, if you're able to monitor and say, okay, I'm going to be watched now. Uh, so Val will go ahead and demonstrate the, the dynamic instrumentation uh, version of the unpacker. Okay, so I'm going to show a short movie that demonstrates how this works. Okay, so in this case, we've got a copy of a piece of malware that's been packed with FSG. We're going to sort of run through some repetitive steps, but this sort of proves the whole process of what we're going through. Uh, this file is also executable. It actually works and runs. Um, and so we're just making sure here that it's, it's not actually running. Okay, so we're going to dump this uh, obfuscated file into IDA and have it analyze it and see what we see. And this is sort of similar to the previous case. I think FSG is a slightly better packer than UPEX. Um, but you're gonna see the same sorts of problems. There's not much information here for us to analyze. You know, there's nothing for us to look at. So the binary's been obfuscated. So in this case, we're gonna run our tool rather than going through the, the sort of manual Ali debug Lord PE process. It's gonna run and basically it's gonna be tracking memory reads, writes, and executes. So here momentarily we should see a, a big pile of files that have been dumped. So our tool basically dumps these files automatically for you. And you can see the files are named, um, that they contain the original entry point that we guessed at in the file names. Uh, we're working on automating the import rebuilding process. We ran out of time for this demo, but um, we'll be there soon. So we're running import rec to rebuild this. And generally, it's going to be one of the first couple of dumps. And in that case, you can see this is the entry point we found earlier. So this sort of validates our process. Hey, look, we found the entry point automatically. So we're going to repair the dump with that particular entry point, pop it open in IDA, and hopefully we'll see uh, much better code that we can analyze. So I'm opening the file that was uh, dumped and then rebuilt with import rec. And you can see it looks much better. There's you know, valid instructions, uh, there's names. We should be able to see functions internal. Uh, blue is good. On the top there, that graph, the more blue, the better. So here's the internal functions. And the import table is, is fully populated. So if you have thousands of files, that's a much faster process for analyzing these files rather than the sort of manual, tedious, figuring it out yourself. Here you can see valid uh, assembly instructions. We can actually hop around. Um, a, a sign of a well deobfuscated file is, can I follow uh, xrefs in the file and jump to different function calls? And in this case, we can. 
So it's been unpacked pretty well. And it works for most of the generic uh, packers like FSG, the ones that Danny mentioned earlier. So you can see here we even have interesting strings that make sense in English. Okay, the problem with dynamic instrumentation is that it's, it's extremely detectable. Uh, Intel's pin actually inserts itself into process memory and uh, actually will do a checksumming so that it'll, it'll come across these and basically find it. Uh, so signature scanning that's implemented in harder packers like Armadillo and T-Lock uh, will find this. So we need to extend this to work generically and non-detectably. Um, this method is also slow. It's roughly a thousand times slower than native at best. Um, and other, other methods and tools can be even slower. So we need a faster implementation. So we need some core operating system component that monitors all memory, uh, intercepts those memory accesses, uh, provides some method so that we can log it, and it's a fundamental part of the OS that the packer can't get rid of. So uh, we looked at the uh, memory management unit of uh, of the Intel processors, and we'll just we'll just go over a quick uh, OS 101 uh, for how virtual memory works. So in Intel memory, each process has its own memory, uh, and you must translate that address from a virtual address to a physical address, or the address that's actually on the chip of RAM. Um, and so for this, we're using non-physical uh, address extension uh, mode and 32-bit processors. So this is a two-page index and then a byte index into the actual page. Um, and, and again, each process has its own uh, page directory. So if we take our virtual address, uh, the first 20 bits, 20 bits are the virtual page number. Inside of that, using the CR3, we find an index into the page directory to get the page frame number. Uh, the second 10 bits get you the page table entry. And the page table entry is actually where we're, we're playing our tricks with. Um, and so this contains permissions and, and that sort of thing. And then actually, when you get that, you get the byte index into the page that's pointed by all of that. And so that's how the processor translates memory, and that's how your, um, the page fault handler will translate it. So all of these are hardware-defined data structures. And again, they contain permissions, uh, whether they're present or been page to disk. Um, the page table entry also has this. It's the next layer down, and it has all these other bits which we can use to overload. Um, so to speed all this up, there's a TLB, which is a translation look-aside buffer, um, and it, it resolves this as fast as possible and provides a, a cached way to look up addresses. Um, and if it, if it has a problem, let's say that there's a page that's not loaded in RAM or there are incorrect privileges or it's loaded but mapped with demand paging, then it talks to the operating system. Um, and also if the address is not legal, if you've ever referenced null memory, this is, uh, this is involved. Uh, so that's what we're going to, uh, to overload. Um, and Intel actually creates two TLBs. Uh, first is a data TLB and instruction TLB. Uh, the, Intel, the instruction TLB is referenced a lot more than the data TLB, so it, it makes sense to optimize that a lot more. So to load instructions into the data TLB, you simply just reference memory. Uh, the move instruction on the top is how that happens. Uh, to load uh, data into the, or addresses into the instruction TLB, you actually have to call into that address. So that requires backing up your memory or your next instruction uh, with a return call, calling that, and then once you're back, uh, restoring it. And so that'll load the address. Um, and so once an address is, is, is moved forward here, uh, or let's say an address is referenced, the hardware uh, first looks to see if it's present in its cache. Uh, if it isn't, then it walks the page directory the same way the page fault handler would. If that still isn't correct, it looks, or uh, once it finds it, it says, is this uh, page table entry valid? Uh, if not, then that's when it kicks it over to the operating system side, which is code where we can control. And then there's checks to see if it's page to disk and are the permissions correct. Um, and then there's uh, errors inside of there that go there. So what we're going to actually overload is the uh, permissions. So Saffron. Are there any Firefly plans? That's where we got the name from. Uh, Saffron uses a uh, Intel pin and a hybrid page fault handler. Uh, this is in, inspired by the really great work of Joe Stewart, so if you're out there, thank you very much. Um, we designed it for 32-bit Intel CPUs, and we replaced the trap handler in Windows. 
and we want to log memory accesses. So there's been some previous work uh, to this. Uh, Shadow Walker by Jamie Butler and uh, uh, Sherry Sparks. This was, um, this was used to behold my magnificence. Um, <laughs> Uh, this was used to hide memory pages uh, inside the kernel. Uh, and this is one of the first references we found to this. PAX actually does uh, buffer overflow protection for Linux. Um, OLLI break on execute. Uh, this was a uh, kernel module coupling for OLLI debug, which allowed you to tag sections of an executable and then break on that, uh, done by Joe Stewart. And recently, Memolize uh, by Scape. Uh, this was done for tracing memory accesses for the purposes of developing exploits. Um, so the first one, we're not really uh, trying to hide memory from the kernel. Uh, PAX, buffer overflow protection, we're for it, but it doesn't help us here. Um, Ollie Bone, uh, it still has a lot of the detection problems that, um, that Ollie Debug has, so that doesn't do that. And Memolize is, is again, not, not interested in being covert. So Saffron uh, system implementation is we first short out the interrupt descriptor table and point it at our new page fault handler and uh, do some determination whether it's a page or a process area that we're interested in. Uh, if it's not, we hand it off to the page fault handler. Um, and if we are interested in it, we hand it to our logging system and allow uh, code to continue execution. Um, and we have a process monitor that sits in RAM. Uh, and what you should take from this is that the malicious executable is we have no hooks into its memory. We're monitoring everything from the operating system. So the mechanism that we, we use is uh, we overload the supervisor bit in the page fault handler. Um, and the step is to find all the process memory that you're going to use and uh, set the supervisor bit. Um, and then you invalidate the TLB or flush it so that it uh, will actually trigger an OS page fault. Once you've found all that memory, or the other way, there's a couple ways you can find the memory. Um, you can iterate through every single address. Uh, you can iterate through all the pages. Uh, but actually what works best is reading the PE header and finding all the sections. So once, once a memory has trapped, uh, we determine if we're watching that process. Uh, we don't want to hook on kernel memory or another process's memory because hilarity won't sue. Um, next, uh, once we've figured out it's ours, we unset the supervisor bit, uh, we lo which loads, allows us to load the memory into the TLB and allows the process to actually run it. And then we put the supervisor bit back on so we can see it again. So, modifying the unpacker that we wrote for the dynamic instrumentation version of Saffron uh, we watch for written pages and then executions into each of those pages. And uh, each time we see an execution into a page, we'll mark that address as the original entry point and uh, dump the process of that memory. And what's, what's nice about the Intel TLB is that it actually lets you uh, decouple those and, and it sort of does a lot of the work for you. So uh, the results from this are that reads, writes, and executes are exposed. You can see them. Um, and program execution can be tracked and thus controlled. Um, and each execution only shows for each, each page. You get the first address inside of that, but that actually turns out better. Um, and it's extremely fast because it's running on raw hardware. So we'll go ahead and demonstrate the... So what we're going to do is take this tlock executable, uh, show that we're uh, run it through PID. It's actually encrypted with tlock. Uh, tlock is actually one of the, the more difficult ones. And we're also going to take a UPEX encrypted version of the same executable. Uh, we're, we're looking at the UPEX one to find the original entry point, uh, just so we know. You don't have to know the original entry point, but it helps us here. So we run the, the same script that Val ran again and find that uh, the OEP is right here. And so for this demo, we're using the same address uh, that we know of here. Now we'll actually load the kernel module into place, which shorts out the page fault handler, sets ourselves up for logging, and uh, those, those sorts of things.
Now we'll invoke the, uh, the user, process, uh, user monitoring one and we'll load up the TLOC encrypted version of Netbull. And this is kind of what TLOC does. But you can see it finds the original entry point. And there's about seven other addresses uh, that are present there and each one of them have dumps. So we'll go ahead and go look at one of the dumped files which just deposits in the same directory. Or first we'll take a look at the TLOC of the original one that's in memory and it looks terrible. You know, we got this start address, which is pretty worthless. Uh, it doesn't let us do any sort of analysis on it. The names window, there's, there's nothing. Basically, the executable looks like Goatsy. So what we want to do is, is actually get to where we can unpack it. Uh, just to look at the XRFs and that sort of thing. Uh, start, nothing there. This is, if it was a unpacked, it'd be a much uh, bigger graph. So let's actually take the file that we dumped with our Saffron kernel module. And here we can see that there's actually good information. Uh, again, blue on that top graph represents code. So Ida's a little bit more busy, which is always a good sign. Uh, we've got functions inside of here. This is filling out. We can actually go look at those functions and this is actual valid code. If, if uh, you can read this out on the screen, it says there's a password right there. So that's a good place to start looking at. And also the cross references are populated too. So there's good information coming out. Uh, the flow graph of the entire executables is full. A lot better than just start. Yeah. We've got names, we've, uh, there's strings also, interesting ones like the uh, name of the executable and that sort of thing. So we can scroll through these. We've got registry keys, the actual name of the malware which is probably uh, how it got its name originally. And that's it. Okay, so the results of this is that uh, un it works. Um, tricks like the SEH decode problem, which uh, TLOC uses extensively to get into uh, process memory and do the checksumming, are, uh, they pretty much go away. Um, memory checksum, the process is able to look at it itself and look for these executions. So again, we're not looking at any of the process memory. Uh, we don't modify anything. And so uh, things like TLOC are allowed to execute. Um, and this is pretty effective across a wide range of packers. There are some caveats, though. Uh, the system requirements for this are XP Service Pack 2. As far as I know right now, Vista is in a real heavy target of malware, and the malware that is targeting it uh, works on it just fine. Um, you have to turn data execution prevention off. Uh, DEP is a method that Microsoft uses for buffer overflow tracking, um, and it actually plays with the page fault handler, too, and it'll cause some problems. Um, this must mean a single CPU. Uh, this is mostly because we're not supposed to be shorting out the page fault handler and there's certain mutexes that we need access to uh, that Microsoft doesn't want us to because there's really no good reason for somebody to be in the page fault handler except for what we're doing. Um, and, and to enable this, you have to set the one CPU flag. Um, this is also 32-bit uh, only. 64-bit um, malware is starting to pop up, but again, most of the user population is still on 32-bit, so until they can steal my grandmother's credit card using our 64-bit mode, then that's, uh, that's all they'll want to port. The other thing is that this must be run on real hardware. Um, virtual machines, uh, what, one of the ways that they intercept calls and uh, keep themselves running is that they actually play with the TLB themselves, uh, which is a fun bug to track down. Um, uh, otherwise, and virtual machines are extremely detectable, so if you're running your code inside of a virtual machine, uh, it's not going to real work. But the nice thing is, is that you can create a hardware version of a virtual machine pretty easily with uh, minimal hardware. Um, and again, you should, you should probably use an isolated network. Um, one of the other things that we notice is that uh, you shouldn't have a kernel debugger attached because uh, strange things will happen. Um, when it, we were pretty concerned when we got a kernel trap 
uh, when we were debugging the kernel uh, with the user land process running tlock. But you just detach it and it goes away. So uh, today we'll be releasing the dynamic instrumentation version of Saffron. And uh, later we'll be providing a package version of uh, the Saffron kernel uh, and we'll implement a, a custom hardware solution and basically make it so you can do drag and drop unpacking. Um, and then the next step after that is integrating this into Offensive Computing's uh, database. So uh, it's a good time for questions. I'd like to thank uh, my advisor, Lori Liebrock, uh, Houdini, Scape, Bugcheck, Skywing, Ty Bodell, uh, everybody on Uninformed and Vax. So uh, that, if there's any questions. We have a bit of extra time, too, and we have one other demo. Can, can we oh, show that yeah. one real quick? So just to, uh, we'll go through each of the unpackers here. Yeah, just to sort of show how well it does against a oh, wrong, wrong movie player. Looks like it's working. So what we're going to do is uh, we're running it against the uh, AS pack, uh, and this actually finds the original entry point here. Uh, we'll try AS protect as well. That magical address that we showed you uh, again appears correctly. FSG. Again, finds that same address, the first hit. We see an execute into that page. We'll take a look at mu. Same thing, we find that execution. And each time you see one of those lines with the addresses and executions, we're creating successful dumps. And we went and validated all of those with, uh, with, Ollie De or, uh, with Ida. Ida, and it worked great. Uh, P compact too, you find the same ones here. Yeah, basically it's just ripping through pretty much every packer we can get our hands on and, and getting the original entry point and generating a valid dump for each one. So you can see this process is pretty easy to automate. I mean, you could literally just pass a thousand and thousand of files and it would rip through generating unpacked the obfuscated versions for you. So petite, uh, we've got hex, pretty much every packer that, that you can imagine that we were able to get a hold of. There's some commercial packers we weren't able to test yet because we, we didn't purchase them, but uh, if you think back to our graph that shows the most commonly used packers, uh, this pretty much covers like 95% of, of what's in use out there. So like even scrambled UPEX, same thing. And uh, finally, Armadillo. You'll see here that uh, the, the address isn't exactly the same, but it's in the same page, right? Right. So you get the, the address that's in there, and if you actually go in and load it, then uh, you'll find it there. And each of the dump files are generated here, um, and everything's restored. You actually get the icons and resources loaded, and everything uh, just sort of works. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We've got a question over here. What, sure. So what we're tracking is any memory that's been written and has also been executed in. And that's what you're seeing, is it executions into each of those pages there. Um, and on each of those executions, you'll, we actually make a dump because it's very hard to find the original entry point. You can't predict which one it's going to be. In fact, at first we were generating like a thousand files. But what we discovered is generally it's like in the first four almost always. There's, there's some statistical methods. There was an IEEE computer and security article about determining if a file's packed. And so the next step is to actually apply those statistical methods and determine which one is the most unpacked. So. This, this was the Julia Child version of uh, unpacking. We, we knew the original entry point, so we were able to pick that out. If you go through it, again, you would apply the statistical methods and, and figure out which, uh, which one you would know. But in this case, we knew, but we've actually tried this on real malware, like samples that people have uploaded to our sites, 
and it's, it's worked well. You just have to sort of fish through all of them. But yeah, There's a lot of ways to do that automatically. I mean, one real simple way is, is either compress them and see what the compression ratio looks like. If, it's, if it doesn't compress, it's still packed. Uh, run strings across it and try to determine which one has the best strings. You can automate it, or you can do it by hand. And, I mean, if you've only got like four or five dumps to go through, it's a lot better than spending you know, four or eight hours manually unpacking. Yeah. And Arrow made a good point. You can often take just the last one that unpacks. It doesn't give you the original entry point, but it gives you an unpacked binary. We, uh, we begged and borrowed for it. Um, about a year ago, uh, the question was how, would, how did we build our malware database? And we started offensive computing about a year and a half ago. Uh, we were frustrated because we couldn't find samples of malware that we needed. And we asked, well, why isn't anybody just providing this as an open service? And then we didn't find anybody doing that that wasn't um, you know, a real, real strange uh, VX virus collector. And so we decided to create more, a more legitimate uh, collection of this. So, so we, I mean, we use honeypots, we scour the web, grab email attachments. We get a ton of submissions. We, you know, every day people are uploading viruses to us. Um, we've had large collections donated to us. So just, just a variety of methods. We try to collaborate with as many people doing malware analysis as we can. And, and so we built it up pretty quick. And a lot of it's interacting with people like you, um, that sort of thing, going out and trading and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, yes. So that's a, that's a good question. Uh, we, uh, the question was, did we try it on the shifting decode frame? Uh, th the answer is no. We weren't able to find a real reliable sample. So if anybody knows of a good one we can go look for, uh, I, we'll try it out. I suspect we may have problems with that. But you know, we haven't really been able to work yeah. on it very much since we didn't have any samples of it. So offensivecomputing.net, submit a sample. We'll test it and publish the results. That sort of thing. So this, another caveat to this is uh, packers like Themeda, which actually load a kernel module to start looking and seeing if people are doing this sort of thing. Uh, that'll completely uh, destroy this, and it won't work on that. But again, 95% of the packers that are out there don't do that. They're just the real simple ones. Uh, yes? Well, that's, that's where you have to look at the, uh, the entire memory or, and analyze each dump file. Uh, so again, taking a look at the last one, uh, it'll, it'll track all the ones that have been executed. But yeah, there's a possibility that it could miss it. But if it doesn't execute, then you know, it, it might not be of, of as much value. That would be good for us to test more, actually. That's a good idea. We'll try that out. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks very much for listening to us.